Good day, this is Professor Resnick again, and today I want to talk about something new and I hope interesting to you all, which is capitalist competition and how capitalist competition can result in relative surplus value, which is the next theme um, of Marx in present, as presented in, in Capital Volume 1, which is our reading and the other readings that have been assigned to you. So what we're going to discuss here is uh, capitalist competition, the business cycle again, and relative surplus value. And what I want to try and show to you is how capitalist competition um, is going to shape uh, markets. And we're going to get, again, this, this uh, tendency for the economy to decline and the economy to, to expand. So capital, capitalist competition, on one hand, is going to produce two different tendencies. On one hand, uh, for the economy, the capitalist economy to contract and to get a contraction, that is to get a, a downturn in capitalism. And on the other hand, that very process of market competition is going to set in motion forces that will push the economy into expansion. Okay, so let's see what we got here. To do capitalist competition, I'm going to assume the following. We have a variety of different industries across the economy. And again, I'm going to split them into these two broad kinds, the wage good industries and the means of production industries. And in these various industri industries, I'm going to assume that we have different capitalist firms competing with one another, producing a fairly homogeneous uh, commodity in, across these different industries. So let me start. I'll start with the automobile industry to, as a concrete example. So I'm going to start here with, with uh, start here with the C and the V and the S and the W for these, let's say, three capitalist um, uh, uh, enterprises. Um, General Motors, say Honda, and Ford. I understand there are many, many more, but it's enough with just three to show this example. So we have three uh, independent capitalist enterprises operating in the same industry. Don't forget now, private enterprise. Okay, three different boards of directors that are appropriating the surplus produced by these different laborers in General Motors, Honda, and Ford, okay, in the so-called automobile industry. And I'm going to assume for a moment they're producing a fairly homogeneous product called transport, you know, the transportation, moving people from one location to another. Okay? And they all are alike. So I'm going to start with, in these magics, they all buy the same quantum of means of production, say $4. To make life easy for us, let's assume that, that um, a dollar is the same as one hour of abstract labor. Again, don't, don't lose that, okay? Um, if you want, it takes one hour to produce um, a, a, a dollar um, in terms of, uh, if you recall, uh, that gold is the commodity, so it takes one hour to produce an ounce of gold. An ounce of gold is deemed by the state to a dollar. If, if, you, if you bother with that, just assume the state uh, implicitly sets uh, the value as one dollar. That, that is, as one hour equals one dollar, or one dollar equals one hour. That's what this is. So we have here two value of labor power is two dollars, or two hours. Surplus is two, and hence the total value of cars is eight dollars. And I'm going to assume the number of cars produced is one. And I'm going to assume here that the uh, rate of profit, the calculated rate of profit then would be two over six. Two four six, that's a third. And the composition of capital, that's C over C plus V, is uh, four over six. Uh, four over six, what is that? Two thirds. Okay. And finally, the, we put over here the price in this world, that is the total value over the things being produced here, would be eight. Is that correct? This is 24 divided by three. Let me erase this here and get, make it more clean. 
And hence, 24 divided by 3 would be 8. That's the price in the system. So everybody sells for 8. Um, I think we're ready to go. Suppose, let's just take it, the, the Honda, you know, it's, it's an appropriate example. Suppose Honda takes a private action um, in, the, uh, in the enterprise Honda Automobile Company. The board of directors of Honda decide that they are going to purchase additional means of production, the Delta C, of say four, do, four more, four dollars more or four more hours. All right? And I'm going to assume um, that there's a new technology associated with these means, additional means of production that Honda Board of Directors decides to purchase, which is robots. So Honda goes out and purchases four dollars more, this becomes eight. Okay. Now, you can say, well, how, where does that four come from? Well, partly it's financed by the surplus value of Honda, but partly Honda goes out and borrows money from banks and persuades the bank bankers, a subsumed class, persuades those bankers to lend Honda the additional money so it, it can expand the C. Or maybe Honda is, and or Honda issues new stock and persuades uh, in individuals, uh, p new stockholders, to purchase its stock, and so the Honda will have then, in this uh, IPO, initial uh, uh, public offering, will have then additional resources to purchase the C. So, you know, it goes to the bank. So you've got the three broad ways to finance this. That, that is out of surplus value of Honda, borrowing on the market, um, or issuing stock to stockholders, uh, new stockholders. It gets the additional re resources for the Delta C. So, 8, 10, 12, this becomes then an expansion of 12, this becomes 28, and next I'm going to assume that the additional means of production that Honda has employed here allows Honda to produce more cars. So this becomes 4, okay, let me leave these for the moment, um, or leave, me, leave this the same, but let me change this here, because Honda has increased its, its um, index of mechanization. So it now is 8 over um, 10. So this has become a bigger number. It went from 0.67 to 0.8. And in your reading, Marx spends a lot of time discussing this mechanization the, the, uh, uh, during the, this period of time that in which he's writing in which capitalist firms, firm after firm across the different capitalist industries are becoming more mechanized and one way to look at that is that their ratio of C to C plus V is rising very rapidly as they are purchasing more machines and as I said embodying new technologies. Okay? The final one I want to put on the board now is this one here. It's the average cost of a business. So that would be C plus V divided by UV. So initially we have, uh, for General Motors, that would be six dollars divided by one, six for Ford, because they're similar. And it was six dollars for Honda, but now it's a smaller number, 10 divided by two. So Honda has become, as a result of purchasing uh, more C and raising its productivity, it has become the least cost producer in this industry. No minor matter, as we're going to see in a moment. So let me summarize what we've got here. Okay. As a result of Honda's private action, it's become the least cost producer. It's raised its uh, composition of capital. Okay, as in doing that. So one message is. A capitalist can become the least cost producer, the lowest average cost, by raising its composition of capital. And I'm assuming here okay, that Honda did increase its C. So it went out and it raised the, the C. Its cost went up. But the denominator increased proportionally more so that the ratio, the average cost, fell. And that's the, the, 
the subsumed class of managers in Honda has to make that calculation and persuade the bankers and our stockholders that they should provide the resources because the average cost will fall, allowing Honda to become the least cost. And we're going to see what that's going to deliver to Honda in a particular uh, moment. Next. Okay. As a result of this, the price of a car has fallen from eight to what it was to now seven. Okay. So the, the new price of, of a car is 28 divided by four. The price has become seven. L let's examine that for a moment. Okay. What's this 28? Where does this come from? Well, this is the total value. General Motors produces one car at eight. Ford produces one car, four, four, six, eight. And Honda now produces two cars at the unit value per car, 12 divided by two, that's six. Okay, so if I did this right, it's 12, 20, 28, divided by the number of cars, two, three, four. So this is a weighted average, it's an average, and the seven, once again, is the socially necessary abstract labor time to produce a car, and what it averages over, as you can see, this goes back to several lectures, the concrete labor of each of these private capitalist producers, GM, Honda, and Ford, in this particular industry. This, so this is the weighted average. That's what a socially necessary abstract labor time is in this, this example I'm giving you, giving you, of the concrete labors averaged over all the different quantities of, uh, produced in this particular industry. So, for the private time, the social clear is seven, seven, seven. Okay, so that's the, the social in this particular industry. But the private time is different. The private time here is eight, six, eight. So we have a divergence. Okay, in this example, which is one of the things we want to show, a divergence between the private and the social. General Motors and, and uh, Ford are above the social, whereas Honda, because of its offens offensive action, that is raising its productivity, is below the social. All the firms come to market, I'm assuming a competitive industry, that means everybody sells at the same price, Okay, the, the assumption of competition, one market, one price, they all sell for $7 or seven hours. Okay? They have no choice. That's what competition means. The market dictates the price. So everybody sells for this socially necessary abstract labor time of $7 or seven hours. So let me then put on the board a new uh, table. Okay? Let me, I'm going to race this and get a new table going. Here, let me just, to remind us, put this seven here. Here I have the revenue, General Motors, Honda, Ford. The revenue is the price, the socially necessary abstract labor time, that price, $7, times the quantity sold. So GM comes to market. It sells its one unit at what price? Not this, that's the private. It sells at seven, it has no choice. So it gets a revenue of seven, same for Honda, I'm sorry, same for Ford. Honda sells at seven, it sells two cars, so its revenues is $14. Here's the cost. The cost in, your, in, in, in the table uh, that, that you've, you've taken down or you're looking at now or whatever, is for GM, four plus six, Ford, four plus six, Honda is eight plus two, is 10. So the new profits in the market, this is the new profit, the result of this, 
is 1, 4, 1. 7 minus 6, 7 minus 6, 14 minus 10. Look at this. Compare this you know, fancy mathematical expression, this vector of profits. Compare this 1, 4, 1 with what you had before was 2, 2, 2. And you can see what market competition has accomplished. What Honda has done through its offensive action by going out and raising its, its composition of capital, raising its productivity, has taken away profits from General Motors and Honda to itself via this market competition. So Honda's profits have gone up from two to four. It's still exploiting its workers by two, but it is, via the market, taken away some of the surplus, a dollar from General Motors and, the Fo and, and uh, uh, Ford, to itself. So Marx calls this extra two dollars for Ford a super profit. Super profit is the result of market competition. And there, the rate of profit goes up for Honda. This market rate of profit goes up for Honda because this, so this is Honda's. It's getting its surplus value, as it did before, plus this super profit divided by the C plus V. So it's getting 2 plus 2 divided by um, 8 plus 2 is 10. So its rate of profit goes up to 40%, 4 over 10, OK? So Honda has a higher organic composition of capital, a lower cap cost. I'm going to erase this now and put down this new rate of profit, this market rate of profit, this new one, as a result of this. Well, General Motors has now, its rate of profit has gone down. It's 1 over 6. Same thing for Ford. It's now 1 over 6. So the rate of profit for the competitors of GM has fallen as a result of market competition. And their rate of profit has now gone up, for, that is for Honda, from what it was before, uh, what was it before, third, to now four-tenths, okay? So the rate of profit has increased dramatically as a result of raising the organic composition of capital, as a result of being the least cost uh, producer in this system. So the gain for Honda, maybe I should write this down here, the gain from Honda, this is either GM or Ford, is their loss because they are losing the same amount of super profit. So their rate of profit okay, has gone down. It was 2. It's gone down now to 1 over the C plus V of 6. So it's 1 6. So the rate of profit then for, for GM and Ford is gone down because they lose this, this uh, uh, surplus, this super profit, which is gained by Honda. And Honda gains the 2 because both GM and Ford lose a dollar each. So it's kind of, what do the economists call this, a zero-sum game in which market, the, the market competition literally takes away a portion of the surplus already appropriated by the relatively inefficient com, uh, 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 capitalist enterprises and redistributes that surplus to the more efficient capitalist enterprise in the system, which in this case is, is, uh, is Honda. Okay? So market competition, this thing that is celebrated in capitalism, can result in the death of some capitalist enterprises. And that death of some capitalist enterprises indeed is the life and expansion of the more efficient capitalist enterprises who expand. Okay? So that's a, an analysis of what competition does. The next step on this, very, very important, the next step on this is to try and show how this leads, what I just described to you, leads to uh, each and every capitalist trying to 
in this case, raise its, organic, uh, raise its composition of capital to stay in the, to, to survive so that he don't die. Because everybody quickly understands that unless they copy, match what Honda is doing in the automobile industry, they're going to die because you can see what's going to happen. If Ford and Chrysler remain passive in the face of this offensive action of, of Honda, then they're going to go out of business. So Marx is presenting a, you know, a, an analysis here of bankruptcy, death for some capitalist enterprises if they don't match up this competitive game with the innovating uh, uh, enterprise, in this case Honda. Notice something here, okay, before I do the next step. What Honda did here was raise, as I showed you, its C, but I'll make a bigger arrow. The denominator increased even more, so the average cost fell for Honda. So, as I said to you before, proportionally, the, in, the denominator increased proportionally more than did the numerator. But notice something, just be, before I do the next one, we'll come back to this. Any capitalist enterprise, or the managers of any capitalist enterprises, those that occupy this subsumed class and get a cut of the surplus for doing what I'm going to describe now, take this average cost and they can do what? They can do what Honda just did, A, B. They can also search the world for cheaper C and cheaper V, as well as raising the productivity of, of, of labor in the denominator. So you can see now where this average cost variable becomes an important target for managers in these respective enterprises because the best defense is to go on the offense and to search the world for cheaper C, cheaper V, higher productivity. And so the average cost becomes an important objective of managers to keep on pushing it down. So let me go now to the next step, and let me examine this famous example. This is a famous example of Marx in Volume 1, and he picks up it again in Volume 3 of Capital. And he's going to argue here that in order for GM and Ford to avoid going out of business, they're going to, as I, as I just said, they're going to follow or try to, to, to uh, uh, do a parallel kind of strategy as did Honda, and to expand the means of production. So let me now erase all this and go back to what is going to happen if General Motors and Ford act in the same way that Honda did. So just, I understand there's no necessity for this, but suppose they did, which is Marx's question here. So I'll put down here again, GM, Honda, Ford. So C, V, S, W. Suppose GM then expands at sea. So they purchase new means of production containing this new technology of robots, just like Honda. And that's the only change. Okay. So everybody is now producing more cars. So the new The new price in this system, the new price is 36 over 6, $6. Notice what's happened here. The price of a car has fallen, the supply curve has shifted to the right, everybody is deploying a higher uh, uh, amount of, of C. So the only change here, again, is a delta C. The labor force is remaining the same in this industry. When we, haven't ex we could expand employment, but we haven't. So all we've done here is have a change in C, okay? But under the assumption, you have still have four hours, four hours, four hours of this living labor. It's the embodied labor that has changed in this industry by, by assumption. The average cost changes. Okay. Now we have 10. Everybody now is like Honda. They've all become producers of a lower average cost because their productivity of labor has risen. Remember again the, yeah, what I just said to you. Since we have the same labor force producing more things because we have more tools, more factories, 
the productivity of labor is steadily rising. The productivity of labor is steadily rising. Okay? Labor is becoming, if you will, more productive. The rate of profit. Two divided by 10 for each oh my goodness the rate of profit has fallen for each and every capitalist as a result of the composition of capital the composition of capital going up 8 over 10 so they all look like Honda did before. That is, Ford and GM has now successfully expanded their, their machines. So they have now the same uh, uh, mechanization in place as did Honda when it took its offensive action. So Marx draws a, just a, a, a striking conclusion from this, which is the following. As a result of every single capitalist competitor trying to keep up, and they must do so, or otherwise they're going to go out of business. And so the best, again, the best uh, defense, uh, defense against losing your super profit is to go on the offense, that is the managers go on the offense as directed by the board of directors, the board of directors getting the appropriate, appropriating the surplus. They, the message is for each and every set of capitalists in these respective industries, mechanize to avoid going out of business and to capture super profits. As they all do that, the rate of profit falls for each and every one of them. If the rate of profit falls in the economy as a result of this tendency of a higher composition of capital, if the rate of profit falls, you have the possibility of a recession. Because when the rate of profit falls, that implies that K star plus lambda, that's what it's equal to, don't forget, is going to fall, demands for labor power, demands for means of production, and so forth, are going to fall. That's a recession. Look what Marx has done. He has given us a second reason why there may be a business cycle. And the second reason has got to do with competition. The very expansion of the capitalists, where I started, Honda, General Motors, and Ford, going on very robust competition in the automobile industry, in the TV industry, in the computer chip industry, in the food industry, and, and so forth, etc., etc., throughout the entire economy, produces rising productivity of labor, rising composition of cop capital, lower average cost, lower prices, and paradoxically, the possibility of a recession because the rate of profit is driven down so much that in reaction to a lower rate of profit, capitalists begin to cut back their demand for means of production, their demand for labor power, demand for credit, and so forth, et cetera, because they have to make decisions about the future now, and the now is at a lower rate of profit, and they get scared, they get fearful, that the future doesn't look good. In other words, their mood and mind change now, changes now, change now. Their mood and their mind changes now. They become fearful over this, this uh, 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 future because the rate of profit is falling, and the rate of profit is an index of what, you know, in their heads of what may happen. And so they begin to cut back, and you've got a recession. So that which is celebrated in, in capitalism, which is the, the market, that is celebrated by non-Marxian uh, discourses celebrated for its incentives, which is what we just went through, the incentive to innovate and so forth, carries with it the possibility of a recession. Okay? So that's the second thing that Marx has now shown. First thing we did before was the expansion carries within it the seeds of the possibility of a contraction. Here the very uh, the, the very uh, 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 necessity for capitalists to accumulate, and that is the, the K star, the very necessity for them to distribute, to, uh, uh, to secure all these other conditions of existence, carries with it, again, the possibility of this recession. Okay, so that's the, the first of these dramatic results. But like I did before, there's no necessity 
for this to occur. And the no necessity for this to occur is connected to relative surplus value. So that's the one last thing I want to show in this ex exercise. And to show it, notice something here. That the unit value, the unit value of this particular commodity is falling. If this is automobiles, it's a wage good. So it went from eight to seven to six. And it went from eight to seven to six because labor was becoming more and more productive. If you're, this, this is a lecture a long time ago. I told you the inverse relationship between a rise in the productivity of labor and a fall in the unit value. And I, I told you at that time that carried within the possibility of a crisis. If you, I'm going to go back to that. That's a terribly important point. Marx then says, look, a rise in the productivity of labor, that's a wonderful thing that capitalism accomplishes because it develops the forces of production, technology, Delta C goes up and up and up and up. It's quite wonderful. We have more and more wealth for our given labor power. On the other hand, it also carries with it the risk of a bad thing, a recession, which is what we just did, a falling rate of profit as a result of that very good thing, the mechanization which is occurring. Okay? This, another way of saying the same thing, we now, this, this result of, 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 of rising productivity creates a lower unit value, and that lower unit value produces another good thing, which is what I'm going to show you now of relative surplus value. So capitalism is contradictory. This recession need not occur because of this relative surplus value. So let's get that on the board. That's that analysis. I'm going to go back to this equation I derived for you from Paul Sweezy to, to try and, 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 and argue this. Okay? We have two results. The the value of automobiles, unit value of automobiles is falling. And the unit value of the means of production in this you know, computer chips is falling. So the robust competition, if you ask yourself, you know, why is this happening? This is happening because of what I just showed you, the struggle over the struggle over super profits in this V industry, in V industry. And the same thing goes here. This is because of a struggle over super profit in the uh, computer chip industry. Okay? So that's our competition within, within each of these industries. And as a result of that, the unit values fall. Well, look at this equation here. Let's see. If C is falling, then that ratio is going to fall, okay? Because the C is falling in the numerator and denominator, but it'll be falling proportionally more rapidly because you're adding to the den denominator an unchanged V, and hence the ratio of the two will fall. Okay. That means the R is going to be pushed up. So the cheapening of the C, if not, there's no other changes, is going to push up the rate of profit. Well, we've got two different results then. That says competition in the computer chip industry and other means of production industries are pushing the rate of profit down. And pushing it down means the risk of recession. On the other hand, the very cheapening of the means of production implies that those industries which are purchasing means of production get the benefit of a cheaper C. And hence, that's going to push the rate of, their rate of profit, and therefore the rate of profit in the economy, up. An example. Robust competition in the computer chip industry creates a potential disaster for each one of these producers. Why? Because the rising composition of capital in that industry is driving down the rate of profit. The productivity is going up rapidly. And hence, you have the risk of, of you know, a, a cutback in that industry. 
On the other hand, cheaper computer chips is a tremendous benefit to the TV industries and all the other industries that are purchasing the chips because their C is being, in the, in the TV industry, is being cheapened and that increases the profit rate in the TV industry because they're using these chips. So when you, when you look at the, the economy as a totality, you have the benefit to those industries that are buying this cheaper C, the TV and all the wage good industries and so forth, et cetera. And then of course, on the other hand, you have the, the, the problems arising in those industries which are going through intense competition. And so the net impact on the economy is, is, is quite problematic. I shall come back to that in a moment, okay? Coupled with this, we have not only cheaper C as a result of competition, but we have cheaper V. This is what Marx calls this result right here, relative surplus value. The cheapening of V, V goods, what does that mean? Well, let, let, let me, let, let's go back and do this again. I've done this many times, but I'm going to do it again. The value of labor power is equal to two things. The unit value of the wage goods times the wage goods that the workers consume. So, this component is the real wage, the standard of living of workers. This is the unit value of that real wage. This is the goods that the workers actually can purchase. Okay, this right here, the real wage. This, of course, is the price of those goods. So what we have here is that this thing is falling in, in, in labor time. This thing is being pushed down by robust competition. So if this thing, this thing could go up, a little bit. There's no, the real wage can go up and you might expect that. Okay? But if this downward arrow exceeds this upward arrow, the rise in the real wage, the value of labor power is going to fall and this is called relative surplus value. So if, don't forget now, if the, let's go back to the beginning of this course. If this is the length of the workday, if this was V and if this was surplus. So if the length of the workday remains unchanged, which I'm assuming, then a fall in the V means a rise in surplus. So capitalists get a, an extraordinary benefit from intense competition, which is relative surplus value, as well as the cheapening of, of, of C. So put, if you put it all together, we have an interesting and fascinating contradiction in, the, in, in, in an economy like the United States, a kind of chaos that's going on, which is intense competition in each and every industry is pushing this rate of profit down. On the other hand, the very intense competition is setting forth all kinds of cheapening of C and V of the economy, which is push, pushing the rate of profit up. So on one hand, the rate of profit is pushed down. On the other hand, it's being pushed up by the, this is the cheapening effect, the relative surplus value the cheapening of C, this one over here, this, this arrow right here is mechanization, okay? And, 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 you, and this, these two effects that I have you, the arrows being pushed up and down are a result of the same process. They're not too different. The same process being expansion, which set all this in motion. And so the, what happens to the rate of profit is uncertain. Marx captures this by saying, yes, there's a tendency for the rate of profit to fall because of a rise in the composition of capital. But there's also a counter tendency which tends to offset it, which is relative surplus value and the cheapening of C. You'll find this in volume three of capital. And hence the, the, the result at any moment is uncertain. To use our language, the rate of profit is overdetermined by these two different contradictory forces. I want to come back, then I'll, then I'll stop on this, I want to come back to one last uh, uh, a point on this C, since it's very important, it's very controversial 
within the uh, Marxian literature, but it's very, very important in terms of this uh, cheapening of C in particular, but cheapening of C and V, but I want to focus on the cheapening of C. Okay, so let me just erase this, leave this on the, well, I mean, I'll just erase it and put it on again. I just want to, I'm going to, I'm not doing anything new, I'm just new, I'm just examining this C for a moment. What is this C? This is the exchange value of the C goods times the C goods, okay? In other words, very simple, this is the unit value of a machine, $1,000, you know, one machine, or two machines, so this is $2,000 if it were two machines, $1,000 per machine, times two machines is $2,000, okay? All right? First, Marx provides an eloquent, beautiful discussion, description of what's happening in capitalism of his day in volume one of Capital, which I've assigned to you, which is that, my goodness, that's going up. I mean, he's not the only one that notices this. Okay, there are others as well. But ca the growth of capitalism from the 1750s all the way to the world, uh, throughout its entire history, but to, <laughs> 1750, you know, to, to 1850, this first industrial revolution, then 1850 to World War I, this, this uh, second industrial revolution, Marx captures the first part of it, is a robust expansion of machines. That's mechanization. Okay. And he describes quite eloquently how the division of labor and the specialization of task change within factories as human beings get hooked up to these machines. I mean, this, that just goes up. And therefore, this pushes C up. Okay? So C over C plus V rises in part because the quantity of machines goes up. There's no question about that. On the other hand, it's also true that this falls. The unit value of those machines fall. So there's no, there's a, there's two different things going on as a result of the same process. Capitalist competition forces each and every capital to buy more machines, in, in the language of e economics, the capital labor ratio goes up steadily. On the other hand, the very competition that results from that rise in the capital labor ratio cheapens the sea in, you know, in, in iron and steel and machine making and so forth, etc., which then means that the other part of the fraction is falling, and hence this is pushing it down. So some people in the tradition say, well, this arrow always is going to exceed that arrow. It's possible in any, during any particular period that may occur, but it's also possible it doesn't occur, and this could be going in that direction. Okay? You can begin to think of the cheapening of C's, which occurred throughout capitalist history, to see the importance of this as well as this. My, my point being here that this is being pushed in to different directions as a result of this. So the result is a bit ambiguous in terms of what's happening to this, this, this index of these two uh, different forces, okay? You gotta add to this the V. Let me just do this. So the V over here is the exchange value per unit use value of the V goods times this is the real wage part of it. Okay, this is the unit value. Well, the history of capitalism is a fall in this. Can you think of any industry in which the V goods have fallen more than agriculture? There is a massive wage good industry in which there's been a steady rise in the productivity of labor due to mechanization, 
with the result of, yes, a falling rate of profit for farmers, resulting in the United States, the state having intervened to save those farmers, but also cheaper food. Okay, so the price of food in the states, the unit value of food, falls. On the other hand, I'm going to do what I just did over here. The real wage goes up in the states. There's no ambiguity. That is, up until uh, recently, the 1980s, <coughs> for, for as long as we've had data in the states, the real wage of workers rises steadily. Now, you can ask the question, is it possible for this to outweigh this? For sure. It's possible if this outweighed this, that the V would rise, the rate of exploitation would fall, and that would dampen the rate of profit. I think it's, it's an argument one can make in the United States. It hasn't gone like that. This has outweighed this, and hence the V has been pushed down, and the S over V has gone up. But you might ask, let's go back here. You might ask, look, in our language, what overdetermines this? Well, everything overdetermines the use of machines. Okay? Competition shapes it. Credit shapes it. Knowledge shapes it. There are many, many overdeterminants. And I think all those forces together, I think the argument of people is quite correct, is that the uh, capital labor ratio rises because the K rises, rises, rises. No, I don't have any question about that. But that also means the possibility of robust cheapening of C. Let's go over here. What overdetermines this? Well, lots of stuff. Unions shape that. The culture shapes that. You know, the, the culture in the United States of that you all, uh, in order to be successful, you have to consume more. The, the consumerist culture that we have in the States pushes this up. Unions push it up and so forth. The labor market pushes this up. No question about that. Is it possible that this could outweigh this? Yes. But I think the argument here is that the capitalism itself produces such robust competition that it pushes this down. So I think on net, this goes up. And I'm a bit, I am uncertain on this side what's going on. So, uh, you know, in terms of the C, because yes, this is very robust, but this is going up. I, I'm not sure. So I think that the total impact on the rate of profit is, you know, is that. At any particular moment, I don't want to lose it. At any particular moment, to go back to our epistemology, a capitalist can produce a thought concrete at any particular moment, showing in that thought concrete that one of these forces outweighs the other. So at any particular moment, the, capital, uh, the Marxists can intervene, produce an understanding of the economy in which, let's say, this is going up so dramatically during Marxist day that it's outweighing everything else in the economy, so the net effect is a falling rate of profit and then the possibility of recession. For sure, I have no, no problem with that kind of argument, okay? But I think it's problematic to, be, to argue that it's necessarily the result through always that the rate of profit will inevitably fall because of you know, what I just showed you. I think it, a, a more uh, uh, appropriate analysis on this is the rate of profit exists like everything else in contradiction, although at any moment someone can produce a theory you know, theoretical result that's going up or going down or whatever, okay? So we have the result here, that it's possible for the cheapening of C, possible, to offset the tendency for the rate of profit to fall, so the rate of profit doesn't, and the capitalist competition, uh, I'm sorry, then capitalist expansion continues. So you get, you get two, I don't want to lose it now, you got two results here, okay, for this, for what Marx is showing in this uh, uh, craziness of capitalism, these ups and downs that we experience. On one hand, capitalist competition results or propels the economy into a recession. Why? Because each and every capitalist and each and every industry is increasing its composition of capital and that's driving that rate of profit down. On the other hand, this offsetting tendency is the very driving down of the, of the uh, rate of profit, is also a driving down of unit value of these goods, the C and V, which is pushing the rate of profit up. So the economy, which is the totality of these different movements, the rate of profit in the economy which is the rate of profit in the C industry 
and the rate of profit in the V industry. So I got to weight these two things because they, they may not have the same weight in the total economy. If I take the surplus value as a proportion of the total value added here, so this would be in the C industry, this would be in the V industry. The V industry, the C industry. So I, I'm just weighting them by their surplus values. The total is the total value added by the workers. Then I have the following, in this kind of weighted average. I have these things being pushed down and pushed up, pushed down, pushed up, and therefore the rate of profit in the economy exists in contradiction. It is being pushed in different directions. So at the conclusion, that which we think is a wonderful uh, machine, capitalism, capable of de delivering vast wealth, absolutely, is a machine, according to this, which is out of control. It's the machine, an automobile, that's nothing governing it. There's no governor on it. It's a machine that can veer into expansion, wonderful, euphoria. It can a uh, machine that can vary into to contraction, depression. It's a machine that is suffering in this, this, this bipolar way from this euphoria and this uh, recession. That's not a happy machine in which human beings might want to live. That's the second criticism of, of Marx of capitalism. The first one being class exploitation, and the second one being it's really out of control. Let me stop there, and I will see you next time.